come back to Zhang Yuming's early like Weibo posts, back when Weibo wasn't all that censored. And, you know, he was making all these comments about like, look, uh, you know, criticizing the government, saying that there should be more freedom of expression in China. And, you know, you can find those posts from basically every Chinese CEO of mm -hmm. his era, um, mm -hmm. where these folks, they worked at Western technology companies. They a lot of them actually even spent time in the U.S. or in Silicon Valley. And uh, the sort of ideological mindset of the hope of the sort of future that they envisioned for China was much more akin to the sort of peaceful evolution that uh, the U.S. was 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 hoping. And, and, you know, these innovators were the closest, I think, that America has really gotten to sort of creating a a, you know, class of individuals in society which deeply internalized um, a lot of the liberal values that America holds most dear. And for us to get to a point where we are now, where we're telling these folks, no, you can't do this because your country has gone so off the rails that there's no way we could ever trust you. It's a real shame that this is where we are today because these guys were probably like the best hope that America had for, you know, potentially bending China in a different direction. And, and you know, I think she recognized that. Um, which is why uh, we've had all these tech crackdowns over the past few years, because he understood that the Zhang Yuming's and, and, and Ma Yun's of the world were not uh, sort of on board with his mission of, of how he wanted to define, uh, you know, Chinese greatness. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, Chairman, Chairman Jack Ma running the shots of China. We have Xi Jinping. And um, that's the sort of reality that innovators as well as American policymakers are going to be having to grapple with for years and years to come. Hello and welcome to China Talk. Today I have on the great Kevin Chu of the Interconnected Substack. He also works at GitHub. And we're going to be talking about today's TikTok hearing. We're recording this. We started during the halftime intermission of the, the House's long-awaited chance to grill TikTok's CEO. Um, we're going to be getting into the sort of dynamics that led to the hearing, uh, do a little bit of Monday, Monday morning quarterbacking on TikTok's Per lobbying performance over the past few years, as well as talk about more broadly what um, this moment and the Restrict Act means for the future of the U.S. and Chinese technological ecosystems. Kevin, thanks so much for coming on China Talk. Absolutely. Thank you for having me back, uh, Jordan. And just a quick disclaimer for everybody who was listening live or uh, in the recording, I do not speak for GitHub or Microsoft. I am here on my personal capacity, expressing personal opinions only. So, Kevin, what do you think of this hearing? First of all, I think it's clear and unequivocal at this point that TikTok uh, as a company or as a product, uh, because of its Chinese ownership, is being held to a completely different standard or playing field than all its other peer company here in the U.S., whether that's Meta, uh, you know, uh, Snapchat, uh, or other sort of social media company. That is something that I think, uh, coming back to how uh, TikTok has prepared for this uh, hearing, they might have tried to actually argue that, you know, everybody else is doing the same thing that we're doing. And therefore, whatever we're doing as TikTok is, you know, just part of an industry problem. But at least on the Republican side, it's pretty clear now, which has been implicit before, but I think much more on the record that TikTok, because of its ownership, is being held to a completely different uh, standard. Whatever that standard is, is still to be determined. Uh, but I think uh, that the argument that, uh, uh, you know, just because we are doing it, uh, but Facebook's also doing it, we should be talking about it all together. Uh, that argument from TikTok is uh, falling flat as evident by this uh, hearing, uh, at least so far. Yeah, I mean, what's what's remarkable to me is that it took this long. We're here in March 2023. Uh, Trump almost banned the app in 2020. Um, and the sort of groundswell of uh, sort of political consensus making, like all the facts have been there for years now. Um, but the sort of metabolism of the, you know, policy media ecosystem to what TikTok is, what constraints it operates under, um, and the, you know, power and influence that this platform has, uh, watching that sort of move forward and fits and starts over 
you know, a, a multi-year process has been really fascinating and a, and a really interesting civics lesson for me in, you know, what it takes to go from sort of a, a, an idea to consensus to action. And, and, you know, just over the past week, we finally seen that the Biden administration has made a decision that, you know, Project Texas, which they've been, uh, which TikTok has been pushing for the past few years is not going to cut it. Yeah. And I think uh, this has to do, in my opinion, with also the legal uh, sort of justification uh, of either banning or forcing a sale of TikTok, which actually gets into the Restrict Act that was proposed by the Senate. Right. But let me first kind of talk about the Project Texas angle. Too. I think that's pretty interesting, uh, especially coming from uh, listening to this hearing is still going on right now. But one of the talking points that is very clear that Zhou uh, Shouzi, uh, which is the Chinese pronunciation of the guy's uh, uh, you know name, uh, is falling back on is Project Texas, right? He's like, uh, right now, we're still basically not being able to guarantee that there's no access to American data. But once Project Texas is done, we will be. We're spending billions of dollars on it. No one else in our industry is doing it. So he's trying to say that once we finish Project Texas, uh, we'll be good. And, you know, the, the, the question here is, one, why is it taking so long for Project Texas to be finished since that, you know, it's like at least a year and a half project at this point. And also, if that is going to be the linchpin to solve uh, TikTok's problem, let's just say, uh, why go up at the uh, hearing now and wait for it to you know, what either you finish and then report uh, to the American public or to Congress or give a much, much more precise uh, progress report even, right? Like it's 60% done, it's 80% done. I think with the other commitment that he made that was maybe marginally newsmaking is that TikTok is also planning to delete all American user data that's currently being stored in this Virginia data center that's not Oracle run, therefore not Project Texas and the uh, the backup in the Singapore uh, data center. So it's an ongoing project, which makes uh, the TikTok CEO's job today, quite frankly, way more difficult than it probably could have been. Yeah, I mean, this is this is sort of the weirdest thing of all of it is like they caught a real break um, by having Trump sort of get distracted and, you know, Larry Ellison whisper in his ear that like he had a solution and they had three years to put in place a better sort of, you know, better fact pattern to be able to go to these sorts of debates and, you know, testify in front of Congress and and give a more convincing pitch that, look, we get it and we're doing something about it. And, you know, maybe they just thought they could be cute and, you know, be really quiet and 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 eventually sort of end up at a place where uh, this this fell off the headlines. And maybe, you know, if U.S. China relations had had developed in a different way than it had over the past few years, that might have been a more feasible strategy. Or maybe, you know, this whatever Project Texas is, is so many billions of dollars that the sort of um, utility and having a better talking point to congressional staffers wasn't worth the like expected value, you know, the expected value of that wasn't worth the, you know, five, ten billion dollars or whatever that it would take to hire all these new American engineers and port everything out of China. But the fact is that we're sitting here in March of 2023 um, with the CEO being unable to definitively answer questions about, um, you know, engineers based on the mainland having access to the algorithm and data that these Congress people are so focused on. And it didn't have to be that. Uh, you know, Kevin, you, you've you been talking a lot over the past three years, and we've done shows about this, of the idea that they could have decided to kind of do what Elon is ostensibly going to be doing with TikTok, which is open sourcing the entire algorithm. So uh, talk me through a little bit about how that, you know, what 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 that road not taken could have looked like and why that might have been a potential solution for um, bike dance to ameliorate some of these concerns. I think one of the things, and I've heard this from a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs and business people, not just, you know, at the TikTok level, when Trump lost the 2020 election and Biden became president, there was this false sense of comfort that U.S.-China relations will get kind of mag uh, magically better, right, overnight. And I think that might have lulled a lot of the TikTok and Biden's leadership into thinking that this is something that they can uh, negotiate uh, away, right? Which you know there is technically still a pending negotiation with the Biden administration to talk about this. But 
I think it's very clear that if uh, you know the administration, the Biden administration could have banned this uh, app, they probably would have done it by now. But because the Trump attempt to ban the app was struck down by not one but two federal judges uh, for kind of a abuse of the you know economic emergency powers act, right, which is sort of his justification for how he as president could do this, and it clearly didn't work. Obviously, the Biden administration wouldn't try to do it again because uh, only if only because you avoid the embarrassment that, the, you know, their order could also be struck down uh, by the court. And the, now that we have a proposal like the Restrict Act, which came out of the Senate a few weeks ago, that more explicitly gives uh, the president and the executive branch the power to do these sort of things. And if that, you know, bill gets passed, then it's just a much easier legal a process to ban not just TikTok, but any uh, kind of Chinese uh, tech company and their product in the United States, if there is enough justification of a national security concern uh, to uh, push uh, them out. And that's sort of the game that I think is so DC inside baseball, right? Like how could the president just be able to strike down by the court? Oh, we have a new friendlier president potentially than Trump and life is going to be okay. I think uh, that was what happened in the last uh, two to three years. Uh, and it's now coming to light again where that was a false, uh, almost a fantasy uh, that a lot of these folks were living in. Uh, and it's coming to a head right now with the TikTok hearing. So, Kevin, what is, what's in the Restrict Act and what struck out to you about it? So the Restrict Act is a proposal from the Senate uh, and introduced by uh, Senator Mark Warner, uh, from the Democratic side, uh, Senator John Bloom from the Republican side. It also already has the enthusiastic endorsement of uh, Senator John Manchin, uh, which depending on the day, you don't really know if he's Republican or Democrat or wherever he feels like he wants to be. Uh, but it's a act, uh, it's a, a proposal, it's, it's a bill, it's not a law, it's a bill that basically gives the president and the executive branch, uh, namely the Department of Commerce, very wide range uh, of power to determine uh, what kind of technology products or services from America's forward foreign adversary, right? That's a very specific set of definition that includes the People's Republic of China, also Hong Kong and Macau, uh, Russia, Cuba, Iran, uh, North Korea, and Venezuela under Maduro, anything from those countries uh, that, that the president now has the power to review and to figure out whether they pose any national security threat uh, and to uh, have the power to deal with it, uh, you know, accordingly, right? Which could be a sale, it could be a ban, it could be whatever the executive uh, branch uh, sees fit. And what really struck out, uh, really was interesting to me from this bill uh, is that the definition, the list of things that could fall under the covered technology areas for this bill is extremely comprehensive. It basically covers everything that any technology company could make under the sun, right? So it's not just kind of a usual suspect of networking equipment or drones or other sort of hardware that we've come to uh, be familiar with as potential uh, foreign adversary uh, spywares, let's just say, that's in the United States. But it includes certainly social media platforms, includes e-commerce technology and services, uh, includes a bunch of strategic uh, you know, areas like AI, quantum computing, cryptography, biotech, all that sort of stuff. And it also includes cloud services as well. So CDN, kind of SaaS product, and even the companies that manage uh, open source software, which, you know, technically is not actually owned uh, by any company. Right? Open source is just this thing that's a piece of code that you can access uh, on the internet to use as you see fit for the most part. I'm glossing over a bunch of details on open source, but I think generally speaking, uh, that's how you could understand open source in this context. Even companies that are commercializing or utilizing open source for their business gains are now under the coverage of this act, which to me is uh, basically spelled game over uh, for any Chinese tech company, not just the big ones, but even the relatively small ones, the uh, startup ones that want to gain some market share here in the U.S. So I moved to China in 2017, and the even then, she had just changed the constitution, the sort of, the, the dark clouds were on the horizon. But even then, like, there was still this vision that maybe some sort of, uh, you know, interconnected 
uh, co commercial technological interaction between China and the rest of the world could potentially kind of create um, or, or um, you know, build the context in which the U.S. and China could relate to each other on better terms. And uh, this hearing and the Restrict Act uh, really marked to me an end of an era. Uh, you know, not that we need any more, uh, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can put that at, uh, maybe you can date it from no limits friendship and, 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 and Putin and the war in Ukraine, but, um, the sort of consensus that has been manifested with this bill and TikTok being banned, I think are a real, um, marker for just how far we've gone and how much it's going to take to shake this consensus of, um, of uh, just the, the 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 idea that's made it into the American political bloodstream that U.S. Chinese technological interaction is uh, somewhat akin to like doing deals with the enemy and everything uh, you know any any sort of uh, sort of commercial or technological engagement needs to be viewed through that lens because of the broader uh, uh, challenges that are facing the U.S. and China. And, you know, we've done lots of other shows on China Talk that have explored, you know, why that is, whether or not it's justified, you know, is this she, is this the U.S. that that really bears the blunt of the blame here. But the, the consensus um, that the, the, the consensus that's developed seems very, you know, seems strong and um you know, it's it's a it's like I like from a normative sense, I, I think where I am on this is it kind of has to happen. Um, but I I there, there's something that I find about the moment we're in, which is so sad um, because I don't think it's inevitable that um, the U.S. and China had to end up where we are today. And, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to put it like 90, 10 on 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 Xi and Beijing's shoulders for for pushing us, uh, pushing us to this moment. But, you know, when, when I look at, um, you know, the likes of Zhang Yuming and, you know, this 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 uh, this TikTok CEO who seems like a really nice guy, it's like it's it, we would we would be in a much nicer world if the two countries and the two systems were in a place where they could be able to build trust in each other. And this guy could be thinking about how to, you know, make creators more money and, um, you know, not have to spend all his time on completely justified uh, sort of concerns about data privacy and al algorithmic bias. But um, that's not the world and that's not the timeline that we're in. And there's something, I think there's something about the, um, the discourse in the U.S. around the U.S.-China relationship, which isn't quite grappling with, like, the tragedy of all of this. And, you know, it's probably, I think the, the most tragic thing is not necessarily just the U.S.-China tech relationship. It's the trajectory of, of, of Chinese governance over the past, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, but it is something that is deeply sad um, that this is the, um, uh, um, this is the, this is the place that we're all in. I think the marker of this being an end of an era with the TikTok hearing today, the Restrict Act or something like it possibly becoming a law is not that hyperbolic, to be honest. And this might be because I'm more deeper in the tech industry these days. Obviously, I had a past life in D.C., but I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, not just from China, but from a lot of different places around the world uh, as well. Uh, I have held hope that while products like TikTok, which poses much more obvious national security threats, could be dealt in one bucket. There are a bunch of different industries, whether it's e-commerce or cloud SaaS or what have you, that are just in a much more innocuous part of the tech industry where these are just entrepreneurs trying to make products, trying to expand their services, trying to make more money, trying to justify their valuation uh, uh, with their VC investors. These are just kind of normal behaviors, right, in business that used to be much more free flowing. But now, uh, certainly based on my understanding or reading of the Restrict Act, they're all being shoved under this much larger movement 
of increasingly adversarial relationship between the two countries that sucks up all these uh, normally very ordinary um, activities into this context. And I think that is a new level of separation that certainly I have not seen, not just in the past three years, but in the past, you know, 30 years, probably. Uh, and uh, it's uh, something that I think just needs to be recognized at this point. There's not a whole lot of wishful thinking. Uh, I think uh, the reality is reality. And a lot of people need to change their plans uh, that they might have uh, drummed up and dreamed up, you know, that Zhang Yiming dreamed up to be a global company uh, to 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, needs to change because uh, that's just the world we uh, live in right now. And that has nothing to do with whether TikTok is a national security threat or not, which there's perfectly enough evidence to suggest that it is. I think there still could be more validation on that claim. Uh, again, we could have dealt with it singularly, right? And, you know, yeah. coming back to all the stuff that we've talked about, about TikTok specifically in the last uh, three years, uh, there are opportunities where TikTok could have led the pack or really stayed in front of this problem as well. Uh, whether it's open sourcing their recommendation algorithm, which uh, you know I've talked about before with you, whether it's open sourcing even the access level between their you know Chinese engineering forces and their American engineering forces to show a little bit more actual transparency, not to spend money building a quote unquote transparency center just to you know parade a few journalists around and watch you know videos about terms and services. Those would actually be ways to technically <laughs> verify, uh, you know, these claims. And again, it is TikTok going well beyond the norm of the industry, uh, which I can understand why they would feel kind of maybe victimized to do. They're like, why are we being held up to a different standard? Why not? Why is Facebook and Snapchat not doing this? But that is just the world that we live in. It, it is that if you do want to operate here as a Chinese owned company, you will have to go well beyond the norm, the standard to demonstrate your trustworthiness. And there are ways to do that via open source, via other ways of communicating this on a technical level. Uh, and uh, we're just, uh, but fortunately that didn't happen with TikTok, right? So uh, here we are. Yeah. Um, sort of one side note and is an interesting sort of like she governance thing ending up in this is like everyone citing the national security law, right? Like Chinese, Chinese, Chinese government can basically make, make, make make private companies do whatever they want if it's in the interest of national security and um you know she didn't need this law to make companies do what he wanted them to do um but the, the sort of vision of of like like the like the legalization of chinese governance is something that he's been very focused on as a sort of like way of being for the party and it's not rule of law it's rule by law right of like we want to create the legal framework to understand and justify everything that we're doing. But, you know, now fast forward five years, six years later, and the saying the quiet part out loud um, of the Chinese of the um, of the Chinese government's influence over every aspect of um, sort of Chinese corporate and, 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 and private life ends up leading to the case where you have uh, where you have the CEO of TikTok basically being forced to answer our questions which are unanswerable um because at the end of the day you know uh bike dance has no uh has no recourse when it ends up um getting those sorts of uh getting those sorts of requests and directives um and that's the thing right jordan like kind of coming back to the hearing right and, you know as live folks tune in uh the hearing is still happening i got like this morning when the news dropped that the Chinese uh, Commerce Ministry issued an official statement about, you know, uh, any sort of TikTok sale or divestiture, divestiture being basically dead on arrival from a Chinese regulatory perspective. It was quite a PR curveball thrown at the TikTok CEO the morning before he has to go to the hill. Like that to me was just like, wow, you're really not trying to make this guy's job any easier <laughs> than they already and like, what is the timing of that was actually a little bit curious. I don't know if you thought much about uh, the timing of that particular statement, which could have happened, frankly, any day. And of course, a lot of uh, members on the hearing committee seized on that statement, right, uh, to really push him to answer a question that is literally impossible for him to answer and basically kind of undermines any sort of valid case that you could have made about the separation between TikTok, the company, the Chinese Communist Party, which is said, the Chinese Communist Party literally just said, you can't be sold without 
yeah. our permission. What do you say to that? And well, yeah. <laughs> and of course, you know, he's, well, I mean, he's... this comes back to the Monday morning quarterback thing. I think he has a better answer for that. He's like, look, in the U.S., like like technology transfer sales, like have to go through sorts of regulatory controls. And like we have the same thing in the PRC, but it leads you to the same point. It, it leads you back to the same question, which all the Congress people have, which is an unanswerable one, which is, look, these algorithms are were created by Chinese engineers who have access to them on a daily basis. And there have been lots of stories about how sort of algorithmic tweaks happen in China that the U.S. employees like have no idea what is going on under the under the hood of their own app. And, you know, that's something, again, that they could have done something about over the past over the past three or four years. Like it's not impossible, uh, but uh, it's for whatever reason, a calculation that they decide wasn't wasn't in TikTok's interest. And now they're having to pay the price for that. Broadening it out a little bit, Kevin, um, we're at the we're, we're sort of at this inflection point where um, more and more uh, of U.S. U.S. and China sort of technological uh, inter interconnect points are going to be unwound. But there are still really dramatic dependencies on both sides of the equation, which aren't going to be, um, you know, which which neither country is going to be able to kind of like wriggle their way out of anytime soon. Um, maybe start off talking about batteries and, you know, what what sort of themes that illustrates about just how reliant these two countries are still going to end up being on each other to to sort of realize their national goals. That's right. Um, so, you know, as this larger trend of deglobalization and, you know, interconnected points uh, being broken down, one, I'm seriously rethinking the name of my newsletter, whether it should still be called interconnected or interconnected with a question mark. Uh, but uh, on the battery points specifically, I think that is one of those industries. And we're talking specifically about uh, electric vehicle batteries, uh, where there is so much lead that, uh, you know, China has built in that industry that as the United States tried to electrify itself uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act, the subsidies that are being uh, rolled out as we speak to the American consumers to buy uh, EVs made by domestic brands like Ford and GM and whatnot, there is a the awkward reliance that is hard for U.S. politicians to recognize of how much U.S. automakers, frankly, simply do not have access to enough domestic technology to acquire uh, reliable batteries for their EVs. And they must rely on kind of global leaders like CATL, which is a Chinese company that is by far the largest supplier of EV batteries in the world, uh, rely on their technology. Uh, to be able to make the American dream of electrification come true. And the evidence, I'll actually point to two recent evidence. One, a lot of folks might have heard about, which is Ford has decided to build EV battery in Michigan with CATL's technology uh, to be able to simply supply uh, enough uh, functioning battery for the next generation of uh, Mach 3 and or Mach E, I think, uh, and also the EV pickup truck, uh, the Ford 150. And a more recent uh, news is that uh, I think this was just reported on today. Uh, Ford had a, a battery incident uh, where a bunch of trucks were caught on fire. They paused the production and the batteries were being supplied by the South Korea uh, battery giant SK or the, co the company is actually called SK Ohm or SK Ohm is their battery subsidiary. And it's been, you know, diagnosed now and published by the U.S. regulators that these batteries are uh, defective and is one of the causes, at least, of the fire, which kind of further pours um, you know, oil on the fire, so to speak, that even the alliance uh, that the U.S. has built around the world uh, with South Korea, Japan uh, and other countries, that isn't enough to really catch up to the lead that China has built in this particular industry of EV battery making to be able to help Americans electrify. So that is one industry where, you know, the the, the practicality of uh, decoupling or deglobalization uh, is about to really hit, you know, where we see the rubber meets the road because it's very kind of easy to talk about it in a congressional setting, even in a legislative setting, uh, whether it's giving money away 
uh, to incentivize or to push company out in the context of restrict act. But if you need a battery, you need a battery. You don't want to roll out trucks that's going to set on fire. And there is this one source of reliable battery, and it just happens to be from your foreign adversary. So there are still threads of interconnectedness, uh, but uh, it's sort of dangling on these very uh, loose, uh, you know, rope lines, technological reliance uh, that's hard to catch up. And it's hard to kind of really recognize honestly, too, if you are someone who is in D.C. and trying to uh, drum up. Uh, all these uh, narratives about uh, the globalization decoupling. Yeah. One of the, uh, the, the the most interesting one transitioning to talking a little about AI is um, the idea that Chinese firms are going to be increasingly reliant on uh, U.S. cloud providers to have access to the latest and greatest NVIDIA chips um, that are going to be run from data centers in, you know, Singapore. Uh, this given the given this sort of export control restrictions um you know th there'll be some wiggle room i think with 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 chips to sort of stay around the 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 capabilities that have been developed in in 2020 and 2021 but it won't take very long for the like hacks um that um nvidia has done to get its um get its chips you know just under the limits that the commerce department has set um, for that stuff to just be out of date and, you know, not nearly as performant or as energy efficient as what you can get from the um, from the latest and greatest technologies. And the solution now um, is for sort of foreign cloud providers to allow the, the Tencents and, and, and Ali's and ByteDance's of the world to train their models just outside of China, um, because, of course, you know, China can't uh, can't develop. Uh, uh, leading edge, uh, leading edge uh, chips and supercomputers without access to, um, you know, the likes of the likes of TSMC. But I, I find it very hard to imagine a world in which two to three years from now, when it becomes even clearer that these models and the inference needed to power them on a sort of nationwide scale um, is something that the U.S. is providing China, um, if that's going to be something that is going to fly when Jensen Huang uh, inevitably in 2024 uh, will be called in kind of in front of Congress to ask why he is a, why he is doing stuff, which is sort of like um, powering the, 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 the Chinese economy. Yeah, I think that's another one where the interconnectedness still holds, but it's just kind of two layers beneath the surface. Um, I shouldn't be surprised by this, but I was surprised to read that, oh, of course, you could just rent the fucking GPUs in a data center in Singapore or in Dubai or in wherever that is not the United States and not in China. That is so obvious and you just put in a credit card and AWS or, you know, GCP will gladly take your money to run those workloads and never ask a question, right? Or even not a, or you can do it via partners where they're domiciled elsewhere outside the United States and uh, uh, the U.S. And this is something that is very standard in the industry of cloud computing infrastructure, data infrastructure, there are just webs of uh, partners and global service integrators, you know, these are called GCIs, you know, huge Indian companies. Accenture, they do this stuff for a living. And, you know, initially when we all heard about the news about video, you know, the sanction uh, cannot sell the highest end GPU to China, we're like, oh crap, this is it. But then it's like, oh yeah, they just live in the cloud. You rent them for the most part anyways, if you are yeah. a company. Now, it does still handicap national initiatives where you do want to own the hardware to develop your supercomputer. I think that will get set back a few um, you know, years perhaps uh, in China. But the NVIDIA has a monopoly on the entire hardware side of, uh, you know, AI training uh, and inference generating right now. There's no question about it. You just look at the stock, it's going up and up, doesn't matter what the Fed is saying. And that's the reality of business. And that's another thing where... Uh, I don't know whoever's like doing the enforcement in the commerce department, not really aware that you could just rent server. You don't have to buy them. And the effect is pretty much the same, maybe a little bit more expensive, but that is where we are heading to. So uh, I guess this would just be a business boom to all the, you know, uh, cloud regions uh, in um, Singapore and Southeast Asia and maybe even Japan or, you know, South Korea. 
Yeah, I mean, it's I think the the justification around the regulations was like, look, these are national security concerns. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing this for national security and the PLA can't be that dumb to run their sort of like ballistic modeling in Singapore uh, because America will like find out about that and then like we'll be able to see their ballistic modeling or whatever. But maybe um, not. I think that could be right. Yeah. Right? Like they that part of the modeling or that AI initiative in China may will probably never leave the border for obvious reasons, but it doesn't necessarily handicap your, you know, your sense times of the world. Yeah. Right. Who and are, that's what we've seen is, 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 yeah. is all of these, all of these entity listed companies basically being able to access whatever NVIDIA compute they want via subsidiaries or, uh, you know, changing the name of their company. So it's not on the entity list anymore. Um, and just finding a friendly, a friendly, uh, friendly cloud service provider to um, uh, to run uh uh you know to 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 run these models for them yeah and you know and these presents like these sanction laws are easy to pass in you know climate that we are we have in dc right now but it's a lot of work to regulate and actually force and implement and for one reason or another you know the commerce department which i did spend a little bit of time working in the past is really becoming kind of the most popular department or agency in DC these days in ways that, again, beyond my wildest expectation, we used to be not that cool and kind of a backwater agency. And now, like, we've been talking about in, like, every single, you know, hot issue of the entire country. So, going to really staff up now. Yeah. No, they, I mean, they had this... Um, uh... They they had this new budget request for for more money for BIS, but the one the one thing that really struck out to me was this two point four million dollar line item for thinking about emerging technologies. And my first response was like, okay, I'm glad you guys are wanting to think about emerging technologies, but if you actually want to control them, you're going to need a lot more than two point four million dollars to do the analysis to understand um, exactly how these industries work and the and the trend lines that you may want to um, uh, uh, bend to make sure that, uh, you know, you're advancing U.S. national and, 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 and economic interests. And uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think two point four million dollars would even get you halfway there just on just on this cloud compute question, which we've been talking about. Yeah, and we're only talking about defense, right, Jordan? Is the offensive yeah. side of this relationship with the Chips Act, which you've written a bunch of about and posted even job descriptions on behalf of the Commerce Department to help them recruit, which is that there's still the offensive part. We still need to build our advanced manufacturing capacity in the United States. Yes, the law has been passed. The money has been allocated. But how are we actually going to properly and intelligently allocate uh, you know, the $52 billion or the $39.6 billion that go directly to manufacturing subsidies. This requires like, really smart people that we actually have not staffed up. And that that's another part that I'm a little bit surprised by. Again, that shouldn't be, which is that, oh, we actually passed the allocation first and then we hired the people to do the allocating. Maybe that is just how we're going to have to work on these things these days. The pace of bills and regulations are outpacing the number of people who can really do the job. Uh, any other points you want to hit, Kevin? What else is on your mind? I know this, it's a, it's a personal issue in a sense, right? For both of us, you've worked in Chinese tech, tech companies in the past. I've worked with a lot of them as well. And there is always an assumption that there's at least a certain part of the economy between these two countries that could just stay benign. Yeah. But I don't think that is the uh, reality that we are walking into whether we like it or not. And that's just something that we need to uh, recognize and operate under. Come back to Zhang Yuming early like Weibo posts um, back when Weibo wasn't all that censored. And, you know, he was making all these comments about like, look, uh, you know, criticizing the government, saying that there should be more freedom of expression in China. And, you know, this is this you can find those posts from basically every Chinese CEO of mm -hmm. his era, um, mm -hmm. where these folks, they they worked at Western technology companies. They A lot of them actually even spent time in the US or in Silicon Valley. And uh, the sort of ideological um, mindset of the hope of the sort of future that they envisioned for China is was not it was was much more akin to the sort of peaceful evolution that uh, the U.S. was 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 hoping, and and you know these 
these these um, innovators were the closest I think that America has really gotten to sort of creating a a you know class of individuals in society which deeply internalized um, a lot of the liberal values that America holds most dear. And for us to get to a point where we are now, where we're telling these folks, no, you can't do this because your country has been ruled because the country of your leadership has gone so off the rails that there's no way we could ever trust you. Um, it's just a, it's a, it's a real, um, it's a real shame that, um, that this is where we, this is where we are today because these guys were probably like the best hope that America had for, um, uh, you know, potentially bending China in a different direction. And, and you know, I think she recognized that, um, which is why uh, we've had all these tech crackdowns over the past few years, because he understood that these people, uh, you know, that, that the Zhang Yumings and, and, and Ma Yuns of the world were not uh, sort of on board with his mission of, of how he wanted to define, uh, you know, Chinese, uh, Chinese greatness. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, Chairman Chairman Jack Ma running the shots of China. We have Xi Jinping, and um, that's the sort of reality that um, as that that sort of uh, innovators as well as American uh, American policymakers are going to be having to grapple with for years and years to come. Yeah, folks like Jack Ping and others uh, would have the, the best ally of the United States in its way of dealing with U.S.-China relations. But uh, instead, we are also doing our best to uh, push them away, uh, all of all to Singapore, apparently. Uh, and, uh, you know, they are kind of, uh, kind of unappreciating, I'd just say, right? Like, uh, in both their home and their target market with that are uh, just unfortunate. So uh, with that... Uh, you know, thanks for having me back on the show, Jordan. Always the good to hang out with you to uh, riff on some of this stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, last thing, let's just talk about like, uh, let's talk about AI for a second. I don't know, you're at GitHub. You guys created like the first real um, product that people are using. Um, you know, any thoughts, reflections on on GPT four and what it means for maybe not just U.S. China relations, but like humanity. Or U.S. China relations, I don't know. Again, you know, I'm just speaking on my own uh, personal views here about uh, anything and everything not related to GitHub or Microsoft. But uh, I will share one thing with you that I think is relevant to the audience is that, so you know how I write this newsletter is actually bilingual, right? So Connected has every post uh, that is both in English and in Chinese that's written by myself. And one new workflow I have incorporated recently with ChatGPT4 in particular is to ask it to translate first draft from English to Chinese for me before I kind of edit and uh, publish. And I found the results, I wouldn't say absolutely better than alternatives, but surprisingly more fun to do. Yeah. And also some of the expressions are a little bit more colloquial in Chinese, which, you know, makes sense for my uh, purpose because I'm writing a personal uh, newsletter. I'm not trying to write an academic paper or a newsletter art or news article or something more formal. And I did find uh, using ChatGPT4 to help me you know, produce the first draft in Chinese has really boosted my either productivity level or at least my happiness level when I'm doing Because if, oh, this is actually a cool way to say it. Oh, this sounds about right for me and my taste. So I really enjoy that on the personal side of things. That's been the most uh, kind of integrated uh, habit that I have had uh, with uh, the GPT-4 uh, chatbot so far. Yeah, it, it is really interesting how it, how it translates from English to Chinese because like, like you never get broken sentences. Like, like right. the English and the Chinese, it's never like it, it like sometimes it doesn't capture the meaning as well, but it's always like a sentence that a real person would write, which is not something that you get from Google Translate or Baidu Translate or DeepL or whatever all these other ones that I've tried and been you know successively disappointed by. And I think that's just like it's it's a really remarkable thing, and it's kind of incredible just imagining where we're going to be six months or a year from now because I think we're 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 definitely in sight of getting to like 99.5 percent where you know maybe maybe pretty soon the only stuff that you don't end up needing to go over a second time is like you know let me put it this way like 
I can envision a world where all that's left that really needs humans to look at is like literature and poetry that really has those like double, triple meanings that you're going to really want to capture that maybe the computer might struggle with. But um, sort of the, the stuff that I do on China Talk of like, yeah, I'm translating some WeChat article or whatever. And like getting the gist is much important than much more important than like the deeper subtlety. We're very close to not needing a human in the loop in that. Yeah, at all. that's right. And I think two points I'll make, that, Jordan. One is that I think the colloquialness, right, that we're talking about with the Chinese translation of ChatGPT4 really speaks to the unique power of large language models uh, more than any other approach to AI or machine learning that we've uh, done uh, so far, right? Because the large language model is all about basically mimicking the most, quali the most quality data that's put it into. Uh, the model as training and then output something that is closest to whatever was modeled before. And because the model, a lot of the training data is, uh, you know, quality, I guess, internet content or whatnot, it just kind of sounds like internet writing, right? At least to me. Yeah. And I think that's just really fits my need in particular because all I'm doing is internet writing, right? All you're doing <laughs> is mostly internet writing. So that really makes me happy and it like boosts my productivity, even though all the other, uh, you know, tools might be technically correct, but they just sound so mechanical. And the other thing too, I'll add, and we can pin this for maybe another day that I've been thinking a lot about is that Chinese as a language, especially the online version of Chinese, it's much more subtle. There are like three, four different uh, entendres and, uh, you know, like xieyin and all these other ways to communicate topics that are hard to communicate or maybe are less fun to communicate, right? So one thing I've been thinking about a lot is, is there just going to be a limit to how good a Chinese uh, chatbot, whether it's Ernie from Baidu or some other uh, uh, AI model would be because the training data itself that they can access is just more subtle. So the output... It's hard to make the output subtle uh, or precise, rather, when the training data is so subtle. And that's a it's very a, kind a of a specifically Chinese internet um, characteristic, if you will. Yeah, I mean, my bet is that we're on this weird exponential curve and like anything like that sort of stuff is going to get smoothed out just by scaling what you can train on. Um, though, uh, I, you know, it, it, it's... It's an interesting question, you know, to what extent, like, it's like something intrinsic about Chinese, uh, uh, the language itself versus, um, uh, uh, you know, versus like all the other challenges we talked about, about export controls or like, you know, not having access to the best algorithms or the best, um, you know, the best computer scientists or whatever. That's going to be, that's going to be something that may hold um, Chinese firms back as they're looking to roll out similar technologies to, um, uh, uh, to open AI. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, that was another that uh, it's been stuck in my brain as a yeah. uh, unique characteristic, especially to the Chinese Internet, per se. Right. Maybe not like Chinese, the language itself, but the yeah. <laughs> the, the Chinese Internet culture. So, yeah, man, you know, there, this has been there fun. Was something about. Whoa, wait, wait, I got one more. So there was something about ByteDance. Like, I think this was like 2018 or 2019. Zhang Yuming decided that everyone in ByteDance had to learn English. And like they were going to try to run the chi the country the company in English and have all the senior level meetings in English and um you know like a lot of Chinese people even highly educated ones are not super comfortable doing English language meetings and um you know that was this weird bottleneck and I think it's something that every uh, global company a company with global operations struggles with is like you know what language are we going to operate in and whatnot and 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 watching the likes of 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 GPT four just really push, um, uh, you know, just just going beyond what what we thought was the state of the art with, you know, Google Translate or what have you, and getting us very close to the sorts of babble fishes where we we speak something and it will come out in another language in a sort of, you know, it, the sound will come out in another language so that you can have like real time meetings with 10 different people in 10 different languages being able to all communicate with one another. Like we're not that far away from, um, fr from that. And, um, uh, it's a, it's a real, um, uh, it's a, it's a real weird irony that like the tools that would make U S and Chinese, uh, and, and just more global, uh, sort of international collabor uh, business collaboration are going to be coming precisely at a time where, you know, we're, we're, we're leaning towards a much more deglobalized world.
Yeah, I think uh, since synthetically live translating, you know, from one language to multiple language will become a pretty solved problem uh, with AI models very soon. Uh, and that will just make any executive, you know, if you're Chinese who wants to run the company in English, so much easier. And one thing I yeah. did here, just as a fun anecdote, is that uh, Liang Rubo, who is, you know, the current CEO of ByteDance, uh, you know, Zhang Yiming's bestie and, uh, you know, a university roommate, I think, uh, has made it his personal OKR to study English. And that's well publicized within the company. So uh, you know, he is trying. Yeah, but maybe, maybe, maybe. He doesn't uh, have to try as hard anymore. Maybe he doesn't. I don't think he, I don't think he has to try hard anymore. More. I don't think it's going to give me that big a deal. It's so weird. I spent so much freaking time learning Chinese. All of a sudden, I don't like. Do I even need it anymore? Well, I think you so, still but... need to be able to read it, right? Yeah. Yes. I. I. I need to. Right. But what I am doing is a very specialized thing, right? Of like trying to understand, like at the like highest possible level of nuance, like U.S. Chinese relations and and politics or whatever. But I think like for any company where like that is not the game you're playing you're trying to sell widgets you're trying to sell software you're trying to you know market or this that and the other thing like like you don't need the you don't need to like get to a hundred percent comprehension like you'll be totally fine with 97 percent uh like i don't think you you lose any sort of like business efficiency if you can just get to that place and that's how you know businesses around the world have been running right is like they find they find someone who's like sort of bicultural or like you know is maybe native in one language and like pretty good in the other and like that's the person they they have to set up their local operations and and that person provides a sort of like interface um but you know those folks aren't linguists right they're business people who happen to have some sort of uh, language skills because they studied it or because of their you know heritage or what have you and and that having that thing just like not like having like the language i mean i don't know maybe it'll still matter maybe there, there there'll be enough humans in the loop that like you know to like figure out what it's going to take to motivate employees and one country or another or, or maybe subtle sort of like user user habit things um i think the kind of whatever native means uh will still be important but there's a lot that won't um which is kind of wild to think about yeah I think we can both confidently say that drafting and the reading uh, spam marketing code pitches will be so much easier in any language going forward, <laughs> no matter uh, which country you want to do your business in. Um, yeah. With that, thanks, Jordan. Okay. This has been awesome, man. Thanks for having me.